Greetings Ranger fans, Jake here for a deeper look at episode 25 of Power Rangers Dino Fury, Missing Pieces. But first, a rapid run through. Let's kick off the counter. It's Morphin time. Okay, so we open on Area 62 where Wreckmate's getting repaired, but then they're all surprised by a new Sporks beast. Oculo, who has extra eyes with x-ray vision, perfect for playing Spot the Sporks, and with the magic game let Slyther found in the basement, aka a dressed up prop steering wheel, they can rewrite the memories of any ranger they encounter. Q two day time skip. In the ranger base, Solon gets a system update while the team searches for Rafcon in the star charts, finding nothing and taking a break to use the light dino key on Amelia's sore shoulder. No witch is cursed there though. Solon wakes up and realizes she made an error before her update, offering recalculations on the star charts. Gotta love math. Izzy and Javi get a Sporks alert while out and about, spotting Slyther, Mucus, and Oculus adding the sporks to their sack before they morph and do battle, soon joined by the other rangers, but quickly frozen by Slyther's amulet. Just a juicy green pickle. And they return to the base, where Solon's skeptical of what's apparently their third pickle sighting in a row, suggesting that they check news reports against their memories before showing off a new star chart with what looks to be Ravcon's triple suns. T-Rex Cosmic Megazord time! Zato uses a cosmic gateway to check for Ravcon, insisting that the others trust Solon's judgment while he's gone, but Emilia's more interested in fixing her shoulder, finding a painfully intense massage video from Jane J. Borg, and is shocked to discover it was inspired by an interrupted buzz blast report with the pink ranger got her shoulder smashed by Ocula. Seems like something she'd remember, right? Realizing that their memories have been manipulated, they're called into battle once again, recognizing the light dino key would only be able to protect them if it wasn't off with Zeno, who's discovered Rafcon missing with only a mysterious message beacon left behind. With a very familiar encoded message. So they go face Slyther, Mucus, the henchman, and Ocula, who claim they've already found most of the sports before Slyther pulls another memory mix-up. The sports beast was only a teddy bear, we all had a nice cuddle. But Zeno races in on the Dino Fury cycle, destroys the amulet, cures his teammates with the light dino key spellbreaker, and they all team up to blind Ocula with the flare and slick keys, almost finishing him off with the Dino Fury force attack until Void Knight interrupts and wipes the floor with them. The villains then escape with the Sports, bringing Void Knight's machine to nearly full power, while Zato de the others on the disappearance of Rafcon, they play back the message from the beacon along with the old broadcast message the modulator picked up back in Lost Signal, discovering they create a clear message about Rafcon's fate with another piece yet to be found. Roll credits. And that's the end of the episode. Now, let's take a deeper look. Well, it looks like a small bit of my theorizing on which episodes were part of the original plan for the series has already been proven wrong. As I would say, that Missing Pieces solidly establishes the Cosmic Combo Raptor Zords as part of the main story, connecting the third episode of the second season directly back to the third episode of the first. However, this new information does reinforce a second theory that I had, which has now been fully confirmed by Seamus Kelly's interview with showrunner Simon Bennett over at Den of Geek, that not only did the expanded order add 22 new episodes in addition to the original single season plan, but that those original episodes also had additional new scenes to bridge together things more smoothly. This interview also confirmed that Void Trap and Numero Uno weren't part of the original plan due to their season finale season premiere structure, which also suggests that the cliffhanger at the end of Waking Nightmares wasn't part of that original plan either. So if those additional episodes to flesh out the story also led to new scenes being included in already written episodes, then the process of differentiating between the two has definitely just become a lot more challenging. And truth be told, it should be. Much like it should be challenging to differentiate between original material and source material when seeing the incorporation of Sentai, these episodes should all feel part of a coherent whole. And this episode does a great job of that. Not only does this episode pick right up with Rekmate's repairs from his battle in the previous episode, but it also continues the search for Rafcon through the star charts that were established two episodes ago in Numero Uno, makes use of the Cosmic Gateway key introduced in Waking Nightmares, and brings back the message from the modulator that was introduced a full season ago in Lost Signal and reinforced during Phoning Home. And that's not even getting into the major development on the Sporks collection plot with Void Knight's machine that was first established in the second episode, Sporks Unleashed. This is some nicely sophisticated storytelling here, and it's specifically the kind of storytelling that I've been wanting to see from Power Rangers for many years. With nearly 30 years and 20 previous installments under its belt, the franchise has seen many different approaches to seasonal storytelling ranging from the early years where they mostly had standalone stories with occasional multi-parters and shifts to the status quo, to seasons like Operation Overdrive, where every single episode was a continuation of the ongoing meta plot. Personally, I find the best approach to be somewhere in the middle, as too little story progression can lead to a loss in audience investment, while an overly linear story like Overdrive's can lead to an exhausting feeling of sameness as episodes are kept on a very narrow path with little deviation. For me, the absolute best example is Power Rangers in Space, which had a season structure perfectly suited to its airing schedule in a way that has never really been matched. However, as time has passed and distribution models have changed, the structure of Power Rangers in Space might no longer be the most appropriate one. 
In Space followed the Fox Kids model of airing new episodes on a weekly basis for the first 16 episodes, taking a summer break, and then returning with a weekday schedule in the fall, which meant that having arcs that ran for approximately 5 episodes, followed by a transitional or standalone episode, worked really well in terms of hooking the audience in every week. However, as the franchise transitioned away from weekday premieres, and now completely to the Netflix model, this approach is no longer really appropriate, as seasons now must be structured for self-paced watching, making sure that each episode works alone as a point to jump in, while also having hooks that build upon one another to encourage binge watching. Basically, having each episode build upon the last in some way to generate a smooth feeling of continuity, while also having a series of different story threads that rotate in and out of prominence to maintain variety. And considering how this episode is structured, it really does feel like that's slowly becoming the new norm for storytelling. Outside of all of the connections that I mentioned earlier, we've also got small details here that were briefly touched upon in the past, so that when they pop up here they feel organic and appropriate, like Ion reminding the Rangers how the Light Dino Key operates after its original introduction in Waking Nightmares, or Solon finally getting her software update after mentioning that it was due for a tune-up just an episode ago in the festival. This goes a long way to making sure these plot elements don't feel overly convenient, as the audience has already been primed to accept them, providing a clear in-universe reason for why Solon wouldn't have noticed the Ranger's memory discrepancies sooner, as well as a clear tool for dealing with the threat of Slyther's amulet. Though the amulet itself is kind of a perfect counterexample of what it looks like when a convenient plot device just does pop up out of nowhere. And I'm sorry, but calling a modified prop steering wheel an amulet is still just kind of weird to me. Also, despite Solon's software update being a nice nod to how Zordon or Alpha would have to be temporarily unavailable due to recharging back in the old days, the way that the Rangers end up distrusting her abilities feels a little out of sync with the rest of the story. As Ion uses her mistake with the star charts as evidence that her update didn't work, despite the mistake being made prior to her update and her immediately correcting it upon rebooting. The functionality of the light dino key also feels a bit inconsistent, as it's used to restore the ranger's memories towards the end of the episode, but has no effect on Amelia's memories when it's used on her towards the start. I mean, I guess that's because it was aimed specifically at her shoulder instead of at her head, but that does still feel like an oddly narrow area of effect. Especially considering how Zato cured everyone in one big burst later on. And while I do like the idea of Amelia's injury being a subtle hint at the beginning that Slyther's plan is already in motion, suggesting that forgotten battles had already taken place during the days of that lovely cityscape time-lapse shot, the idea that they wouldn't be able to better check their records does strain a bit of credulity. From a storytelling perspective, discovering the video footage of their battle through Jane and Jay Borg's wacky massage segment does add a sense of irony to the reveal. But are we really supposed to believe that a ranger battle in the city wouldn't have its own well-labeled and easily searchable video? Does Buzz Blast not use tags? Does Jane need a search engine optimization service? This also isn't helped by Slyther, who presents himself as a grand performer and master schemer, somehow being totally incapable of coming up with better cover stories than just, nope, it was a pickle. Just a pickle. Although I will give the pickle play a pass for being a genuinely funny running gag, and for how thoroughly the Rangers all commit to its juiciness and its greenness, right down to Zato using his telepathy powers to project his pickle-peppered memory onto Solon. And I somehow also feel there's a Rick and Morty gag to be made here. Anyway, it's interesting that the pieces of this episode that remain largely self-contained are also the ones that feel the least developed, with the concept of Slyther's memory manipulations leading to the Rangers unintentionally gaslighting Solon feeling like a genuinely good story idea, but still needing a bit more finesse to really come across as organic, due to the combination of her guessing the plot a bit too easily, the Rangers dismissing her theory a bit too aggressively, and Slyther's ability to execute the plot being a bit too convenient. However, where this episode does excel is in the progression of the two main story arcs at play here, with Zato's discovery that his entire home planet has vanished and been replaced by a message beacon with an incomplete message being a great jump forward with a genuinely interesting hook, while at the same time we see Void Knight coming increasingly close to accomplishing his goal of collecting all the Sporex. And Oculo is kind of a great monster. That guy's got his eyes on the, um, Sporex. 
The idea that we might actually be at the end of the big sports hunt this early in the season, solely due to the game-changing abilities of an otherwise run-of-the-mill sports beast, is quite possibly one of the most intriguing developments of the episode, especially since it clearly drives Void Knight to be more aggressive in his actions against the Rangers, and leaves the additional hook of Oculo still being an active player at the end of things. This once again reinforces the idea that story elements that are touched on during multiple episodes are the ones receiving the best development. Whether it's the hunt for the sporks being progressed through the introduction of a particularly relevant monster, or the hunt for Rafcon coming to something of a head due to the new resources of the Cosmic Dino Key and the subsequently updated star charts. Which, thank you for appropriately demonstrating how long it would take and how challenging it would be to actually track stars that way. Because I may personally have a little bit of experience in this field, and yes! I may kind of spent an entire year in college working through an astrophysics research project where I had to comb through star data to accurately project the trajectories of several dozen or so stars backwards in time a few centuries to identify which one of them may have been the progenitor of a Type 1a supernova. You see, there existed a supernova remnant from what was theoretically a former red giant that was also theoretically part of a binary system with a white dwarf that had siphoned off its mass until it expanded and then, well, boom. But that's all beside the point. The point is that this sort of work is long and tedious, and once you also factor in margins of error for instruments measuring the positions of celestial objects from absurdly long distances away, you don't even have a guarantee of definitive answers. So even with Solon's advanced ranger tech, I can only imagine how challenging it would be to track a specific trio of stars, not across a few centuries, but across literally over 65 million years. So make sure to join me next time for a deeper look at episode 26 of Power Rangers Dino Fury, Tiny Trouble. And if you would like to share this week's rapid run-through, you can find it as a standalone clip over at Morphin Legacy's YouTube channel. Please like, share, subscribe to us both, ring the bell for future notifications, and until next time, farewell Ranger fans, and let the power protect you.